My name is Lynn. I live in uh, New Hampshire. We moved here about a year ago, and um, I've been um, involved in cold wax uh, medium as an artist for the last, I guess, year and a half. And um, I've been trying to find every resource I can to figure out how to do it. And um, for the most part, I um, uh, found Pam um, through some of my uh, diving into the internet. And I was very happy to find her in all her videos and tutorials. And, um, you know, as I've been experimenting, I have some questions, of course, that come up. And that's why we're here today. Okay, that's perfect. And mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're relatively new to cold wax medium and... Yep, that's right. That's right. Let's talk about some of the questions that you asked me because I found them to be, you know, they're, they're so, uh, they're really important. Um, there are so many things that I think an artist will encounter um, at many points and, you know, sometimes it's hard to find that answer. So what was your question that you had? Okay, well, my initial question was through all of my experimentation. Um, I was doing several pieces on um, Arches oil paper because um, it gave me some flexibility and I felt like, well, maybe I wasn't going to waste a lot of material that way. So it worked out well for me. Um, but through that process, I've forgotten which wax I used because I was using both Gamblin and Dorland's wax. And so now that I'm at a point where, gee, maybe I'd like to mount them or put them in a float frame or whatnot, um, I don't know how to finish the piece. I don't know what wax to put on the final surface or how to treat the final layer or if I even need to. Okay, so very good question. So let's address that one first. Um, and I've, uh, okay, so Dorland's versus Gamblin's cold wax medium. They're both, um, they're both fine and they're both compatible with each other. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, I don't, from what I understand, I don't see a problem with, you know, um, mixing going from one to the other so if you don't remember which one you used or you know if that's the case um, I think you know I, I wouldn't worry too much about that working on paper as you know you know you don't want the paper to bend after the the paintings dry right because you risk cracking and you know it's, it's just not meant to, to be put on a surface that's not rigid so your idea of putting it onto a rigid surface or behind glass yes those are the two best ways to show you with now it's a final varnish um originally i and i i personally use gamblin's cold wax medium okay and my reason for using it is uh number one i love the product and i like the consistency of it uh from my understanding between say the gamblin brand versus dorland's is that gamblin's um uh, recipe is just a little bit simpler there's there are a few components that are not in that that are in the dorland's that you know that's one thing it's probably not the biggest thing for me i think the biggest thing is that gamblin is the company that offers many products as you probably know they, they offer all the solvents we need as cold wax artists they offer all the the paints that you might need and so if i can go to one source and get everything i am inclined to do that not only that but i want to emphasize that the Probably the biggest reason I use Gamblin's products is because of their customer service and their support. So my ability to answer you on your question has mm -hmm. to do with the time I spent on the phone with Gamblin. Okay, mm -hmm. and there, are, as you know, there are so many companies out there that now when you call, you get put on hold, and you, know, you might get a person who's not very knowledgeable, and you don't get your questions answered, and it's very frustrating. And um, as an artist, I really care about things being archival and you know, conservation and, and all these things, so I'm sure you do too. Mm -hmm. okay, so, when it comes to the final varnish, what, what I learned from Gamblin is that if you have, um, say, more than, say, 25% cold wax medium to oil, then you do not want to use their product called Gambar, which is a varnish that you can use on traditional oil paintings. You can use it on, you can even use it on acrylic paintings. But when you've got a higher percentage of cold wax medium to the oil paints, then the best thing for you to do is when your painting is dry, um, you're gonna put um, a very thin coat of just cold wax medium, just that, and let it dry. And then, you know, you could put a second coat on there. And now that's important if you're going to mount your painting onto a panel. Okay. Yeah. And is that, let's say you're going to put it on the wall or it's going to be in a gallery or somebody buys it, you know, 
it is a work on paper and then it's on wood. So people, especially if it's a gallery, they're going to say, if you tell them it's a work on paper mounted on wood, they're going to say, well, did you varnish it? But the answer is if you put two layers of cold wax medium on the top, did you varnish it? That is the varnish. That okay. makes them happy, but more importantly, what's important is the painting itself. When you put the, those final layers of cold wax medium over the, the surface, it does seal everything in, you know, and you can even slightly buff it after it's um, completely dry with a soft cotton rag. And, you know, you might get just a slight satin machine, and you may like that. Some people like it matte. But anyways, um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. How, um, if you don't mind my asking, how would you apply it with a, with a squeegee or a, you know, a rag or what's the best way to actually apply that final layer? My favorite way is with a Messermeister tool. Are you familiar with that tool? Say that again. It's called a Messermeister uh, silicone bowl scraper. Okay. I, yep. I have one of those. Okay. Yes. It's like a half moon shape and it has some yes. side. Okay. The reason for that is, um, you're, you're able to put on a very thin layer and that's really what you want now if you didn't have that tool and you just say took a blue shop towel you put it into the um the cold wax medium and just sort of swirl it around and then take maybe another blue shop towel that had no cold wax medium just took the excess off that would be fine too okay good good yeah that sounds great and yeah so that's uh that's that and then um you, have, you had a question also about some of the paintings I had in my catalog. Do you want to ask me what those questions were? Yes. Um, the catalog was simply not. And um, there was several pieces in there that um, had a lot of line drawing on them, whether it was black lines um, or colored lines. And I would love to find out more about how you did that. Um, I'd love to try to integrate that into my work. Um, I've tried some of the tools um, that you mentioned in one of your tutorials, and um, some of them work great on the base layer, on a flat cradle, for example. Um, but when I'm working on the surface of a, a painted surface, I'm struggling with getting some nice sharp lines or um, rich colored lines. And perhaps I'm working on it when it's still too wet. <laughs> you know anxious but um but maybe you can just share how you go about it and that i can you know try to learn from there absolutely and just tell me um sort of a the main uh, mark making tools that you were trying to use so that i understand better what you were what you were using what i've been using mm -hmm. um so, okay so now it's kind of like a test um some Quran dash some charcoal some of the stubby sticks um one of the square water soluble um, graphite sticks. Um, honestly, anything that's in my toolbox that I can get my hands on, I just kind of been working with, but mostly in that category, I guess you can say. Okay, and have you tried any RNF pigment sticks? Yes, I did, yeah. Right. Um, and I love those, but if I want a finer line, then I don't know how to use them to get a finer line. Okay. Those um, are, yeah, those are terrific, uh, you know, perfect, because that's exactly where um, I, I would like to talk to them. Let me just see if I can get that. So, um, so the reason I'm, uh, I prepared this for you, Lynn, was because there were two paintings that you, you were asking about in the catalog. One was called Bits and Bobs, and the other one is called Tranquility. So, now, I want to explain to you, though, that... Uh, kind of like the process of how those paintings were made and I'll, I'll do it quickly here but I want to just show you I believe this first one is bits and bobs and uh, I this had not they both of these paintings had acrylic underpaintings um, and I know there are a lot of artists who like to work in acrylic as well so to me it's kind of like well you can have the best of both worlds um, if you if you do one one crucial step so on the left here is you know kind of one of the early stages is a 36 by 36 inch uh, painting on panel this is acrylic and as you can see lots of marks right just this is the play stage. And then I move over to the right, another play stage. And then, um, let's see if we can advance here. Okay. Okay. Are those, I'm sorry, are both those panels acrylic or did you move into cold wax on the one on the right? No, not yet. This, I'll tell you when I move into a cold wax medium, but oh, okay. right now these are all acrylic. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, 
Okay, so now, okay, now I went from sort of the mid-tones to I'm putting in some darks and kind of seeing how that feels and, you know, still not happy, of course. Um, then uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see it got really dark, but I thought, okay, well, I've got a dark painting. Maybe I'll try to start to uh, um, develop the design, the composition, see if I like it. Well, I kind of pushed it a little bit and eh, wasn't really thrilled with it. So then on the right-hand side, this is when I started to put cold wax medium on there. Um, I had some leftover paint on a palette and I just grabbed um, my silicone, probably two inch tool. And as you can see, these, uh, these areas that kind of look like bricks, you know, in a, in a wall is how I did that. Uh, just a very horizontal movement here. Okay, but that was never meant to be done. Um, then, whoops. Um, put the plane, uh, there's a plane overhead. <laughs> we live near yeah. Pittsburgh. You can probably hear that. It, by yeah. the way, can, can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, I can hear just fine. All right, now, this is where, now look, if I, so, um, I put those, those brick layer type marks on there and I, of course I didn't like it. Well then I had another uh, palette that was at the end of the day with cold wax medium, like, okay, I'm just gonna throw everything that's left on my palette onto this painting. Uh, I just wanna use up the paint, I don't wanna waste it. Well, on the left hand side, this is what I got. And <laughs> this is what happens, I think, for a lot of us, at least for yes. me, right? Uh, it, it's a disaster area. I would call this ugly. Okay, so what do you do with a painting that's super ugly? And then on the right hand side, um, this is where I start to create the shapes that you start to see in my paintings. Okay, now when you talk about fine lines, um, well delineated lines, well defined shapes like circles, and I mean, you look at any one of these torn sheets of newsprint, and that's what this is. These become the shapes that I'm interested in, okay? So what do we do next? We, so I'm laying that down on this kind of um, tacky surface. It's certainly not completely dry. It's maybe a few days into drying, so it's tacky. Mm -hmm. And um, then over on top of those pieces, so let's go back. If you look on the right-hand side, I just took like a, a light-toned um, a key, you know, a, a big amount of paint, and I put it on with a silicone tool. Um, and then I had to peel off each of these pieces once they were all covered up. And when I did that, here are the same shapes, okay? Like here's that U shape and, you know, I selectively chose areas of that painting to cover up here. Like I was looking at, well, what do I have that I kind of like and I, I would like to keep? So I covered those things up with newsprint. Then when I covered the entire painting with the cold wax medium and then pulled the newsprint off, well, this is what I have. Now it's a little easier to look at, but it's certainly not done. It's mm -hmm. just better than it was. Um, can you see these hard edges? Yes, yes, got it. Mm -hmm. okay. Then over here, I started to, uh, because I, I know for me personally, I like a sense of geometry, I started to create some linear uh, bands here, and that's more masking. I call these newsprint things masks. And this is the same thing. You can lay down, you know, pieces of newsprint. You can lay out some linear movement or whatever you want to do. Again, it's newsprint is a wonderful thing when you work with cold wax medium. Then um, here's some more progression. Uh, again, I'm I'm editing now. I, if you look at the previous one, there are still some very large shapes, but they're all very much alike. It's kind of boring, you know. It's certainly not not making me very happy. I then come in and I start to more selectively edit out um, down to this uh, these smaller and smaller shapes. So, so lines like this that you're seeing, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of lines you like. Then all I did was I took a very pointy tool. It could be a nail. It could be an awl. It could be a, you know, anything with a point on it. I took a ruler. I laid it on top of it. This is fairly dry by now. And I basically scored the surface. So this is actually dug into the surface. Got it. Okay. Some things are subtractive. Some things are additive, as you know. Um, and that's the beauty of cold wax medium. Now, when you dig into the surface, what was underneath that was all that dark paint. Mm -hmm. That's why this line looks dark. And that's why this line looks dark. And then over here, this is actually a topical mark. This is more pencil. These are pencil. And again, when you're working on top of a dry and it's fairly smooth, like I selectively chose areas that look kind of smooth, you can certainly draw on the surface like that. And I think what you said was maybe it was too wet. That might have been your problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, so I get rid of that. Okay. Then I moved over here because I felt like, yeah, that's okay, but all the shapes are the same size. So then I threw in a 
a stencil here, which looks like a weird snake, and I didn't like that. So um, moving on, I, I basically felt like I didn't have enough big shapes. I did put in a snake shape, but I didn't like it, so then I started to cover it up with linear bands again because that was so, felt so different to me for these little, little parts here. And then I, um, sorry, I added uh, this actually as a glazed area. Um, so mark making again, you know, this is pencil. This is pencil. And I don't know if I can uh, actually zoom in to this or not, probably not. But this uh, little area here is a very um, highly rendered area where I, I took a pencil and I really made sure that each line you could see it. Same thing over here except that this, unlike a topical line, I dug into the surface. So again, I think you're right. You have to be aware of how dry your painting is. That's okay. okay, okay. Okay, now, um, okay, so there's the final painting. Um, Just fascinating. It's, it, it's amazing that I experienced some of the same things you do where it's such an iterative process yes. that what you start with is just never what you end with. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm so glad that you're you're doing it that way and experiencing it. You enjoy that process? Oh yes, very much. Although I have to say, it has taken me a while to appreciate it more and more. Yeah. Um, I I think when you're sort of trained in a traditional way with something with intent in mind, and then you expect that finished product, you kind of are trained that way, and then to go in a completely reverse direction and let it, your intuition guide you um, and then change your mind one day to the next. Um, it, it's really fascinating. And um, you just kind of get more and more comfortable, or I've gotten more and more comfortable with doing that over time. This is another painting that you asked about. This is called, um, this was the beginning stages of tranquility. I just wanted to show you how, how different, how, how these stages are so different from the final uh, painting. And again, these were acrylic. Uh, on a 36 by 36 inch uh, panel, wooden panel. So it went from, you know, kind of like there's some mid-tones here. I'm just playing and having fun. Then it goes really dark on this side. And um, here I go light. So I went, you know, the, the, the ability to go from, you know, it, well, if I, if I know I want to end with like sort of a light painting, sometimes it will start very dark. So I will start mm -hmm. with the opposite. Yes, yep. Right, do you do that as well? Yep, I sure do, I Great. sure do. So here are some of those marks you might see. Uh, now, I don't know uh, at this stage, looking at these slides, whether, you know, how many of these marks uh, ended up in the final analysis. But, um, but again, this, these marks are a Gamsol drip. So do you, are you familiar with that? Okay. I've not, I, I have some, but I've not used it yet. Okay. Well, just so you know, the way to do that is you have a dry surface on your painting. Then on top of that, you put a wet surface and it, it should probably not be too thick. Then you apply some straight Gamsol with a, either a medicine dropper or a brush or whatever you want to do. It doesn't really matter. Um, you let that, you know, in this case, I had gravity helping me. So these drip marks here were because the panel was on the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let it sit there for like 10 minutes because what's happening is the Gamsol is eating through the surface of your cold wax painting, revealing what's below. But you're not going to see what's revealed until you take that a silicone tool or a Messermeister tool and you squeegee back the Gamsol. So you want to catch the drips on the bottom with like a blue shop towel. And, and you do it a few times until you get that uh, delineation of what you just created by the Gamsol eating through that layer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, okay. very exciting. Well, here, um, the right hand side, I went a little crazy. Um, a lot of this is subtractive. Uh, Probably took a wallpaper scraper here. Um, this is dug in, that's dug in. A lot of dug in marks, a lot of um, subtractive. However, this is a topical mark. And how I did that was I took some oil paint with cold wax medium. So it's kind of that, you know, uh, frosting consistency. Mm -hmm. Then in a separate bottle, I combined a 50 50 uh, solution of 50% Galkid the liquid, and 50% Gamsol, also liquid, in a bottle, okay? And this, again, is something that I learned by talking with Gamblin, and they, they sell both of these products. Now what you have is an excellent medium for um, uh, making your paint more fluid, which means if you like to do brushwork, um, then all you have to do is take that 50-50 solution, and I have it in a dropper bottle, kind of like a ketchup bottle or whatever, and I drip it into 
my pile of this um, frosting consistency cold wax medium. And it could be in a little container, it could be in a cafeteria tray, it depends on how much you're mixing. You know, if you're working really large scale, you kind of want a lot of it. But if you just have a small painting, you might want a little bit of it. In any case, you want to really stir that up very well. You take your brush in there, and that's how you make marks like this. Okay. Oh, fantastic. And in that case, you used, a, I guess, a black or some facsimile of a black yes. as your cold wax medium. Yes, you can see it's, I probably took black or I could, you know, I could have mixed several colors on my palette and threw it into this little bowl and then added the 50-50 and you're good to go. And, you know, really the quality of your line depends on the tool that you apply it with. So if you have a brush or you, know, you could do a mono print onto some paper, you'd get a different kind of mark. Um, just some like endless ways to apply paint in a cold glass medium. Oh, that's fantastic. I had Galkid gel. I wonder if I could use that. Yeah, so Galka gel is something I really, really recommend for mixing with um, paint that is in that frosting consistency stage, okay? And the reason is that you're dealing with two things that are kind of the same uh, uh, thickness and viscosity. Um, and this, again, is a conversation I had with Gamblin because I was like, well, how do I, um, and, and this is another conversation, but it's about why I add Galka gel to my cold wax medium and oils, okay? So... Um, Galka gel, there are, some, there are three, uh, really four main advantages of using Galka gel. Number one is it's going to cook in the drying time. Okay. Um, number two, it's going to give the final product a little bit of a satiny consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, probably the third one is the most important to me, and that is that it makes the adhesion of your layers going from, you know, say layer one through layer five to layer 10 of your painting, it um, enhances the adhesion of these layers. Okay. Is that yours in your background or is that in mine? It's my computer fan, oh, yeah. Interesting, no, no worries. I, I have somebody doing roofing behind me and I thought maybe it's the roof or something. Yeah, no, it kicks on every now and then. Okay. I don't know. It's... No problem. Okay, so. Um, so, and then um, the fourth one is that, of course, um, it, it increases the transparency because when you squirt, uh, squirt the gel out of the tube, you can see how clear it is and it's got resin in it. So, um, the resin is what makes the adhesion better. It's what gives it a bit of a satiny sheen. Okay, so that, those are my reasons for using the Galka gel. Now, if I'm talking about the 50-50, um, I suppose, yes, you could use the Galka gel, no problem. Um, it might be that you have to add just a tad more of the Gamzol because the reason the Galka gel is a gel is because it has less Gamzol in it. So when you think about it, we're talking 50-50 of like and like, you know, liquid to liquid. But if you go from gel to liquid, then the only way to bring that gel up to the 50 mark is to add a little bit more Gamzol. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Sure it does. yeah. I don't. Think that matters too much. I think what you're going for is just the right consistency. Mm -hmm. okay. Now here's the final painting and the reason I wanted to show you this is because here is where those brush marks did remain and then these are topical um, you know whatever carbon graphite whatever I used and the surface was bone dry okay. Okay. Also if you're going to use an RNF pigment stick um, you can use it during the time when your painting is you know wet when it's tacky when it's completely dry you're going to have the best success when it's completely dry if you want the calligraphic mark like this and that's what i did i waited till this painting was really dry um it became a focal point here and i wanted that and i i knew that i couldn't do that until the end of the painting mm -hmm. that's where it's sometimes hard when you're at the end of your painting and you still have to maintain that child like okay i'm just going to do this right <laughs> yes <laughs> it's hard but um but it, it if you can do that then you know your painting will feel lively and fun and you know like you know there's this thing in there that's pretty uh, uh feels pretty crazy so does that answer your question absolutely this has been so helpful very very helpful okay. yeah well thank you so much and I, I really appreciate your time and your interest and uh good luck with your cold wax painting and um I hope you'll keep in touch with me. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your just sharing your experience. Just okay. as something. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. All righty. Yeah, bye. -bye. <laughs>